like to turn uh, with me to the book of Ephesians in chapter 6. What have we been talking about? God's great salvation lived out in his family of faith, the studies of Ephesians. Good answer. Okay? So in recent weeks, we've been talking about this idea, living and loving like Christ. Okay, living's a good thing, right? Okay, loving, that's a good thing. Okay, what Ephesians is trying to tell us, we're supposed to do that like Christ. How well did you think Christ lived? He lived a perfect life. How much do you think Christ loved? A lot. A lot. It's pretty big. It's a big love, right? God wants us to live in love like Christ. So that's been really a lot of what we've talked about with the second half of Ephesians. Uh, last week, we emphasized the kind of synonymous concept of one anothering in every relationship and how the family of faith lives out their one anothering through the different relationships that we have, husbands and wives, parents and children, employers, employees, you know, all those kinds of things we've looked at uh, here in the book of Ephesians and chapter 5 and part of chapter 6. Uh, we recognize the fact that this one anothering in every relationship is different than worshiping the God of individualism. You know, America seems pretty stuck on this idea of individualism. God is all about one another, and so we, we learned about that. So this week we're going to talk about this uh, thing called the armor of God that every Christian, Christian is supposed to wear in order for each of us to fulfill our personal responsibility to stand with that armor, to stand for one another in the family of faith. Okay, so the family of faith is not just to sing Kumbaya and just to give everybody a hug, uh, but God is saying there's a war to fight here, and it requires armor, and we are to stand for one another in this family of faith. So Paul uses this analogy of armor because as the family of faith, we join God our Father in uh, what you might call really an epic battle for the souls of all humanity. And so the title of my message today, uh, we're going to pick up on that theme, right? We're going to talk about being battle-ready soldiers in the family of faith army. So we're going to read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20, and we're going to learn how each of us can put on that full armor of God, okay? Uh, and then actually as I went through this week preparing for this message, and I recognized that I had so much stuff to say about this passage, it kind of got to the point where I thought, oh my goodness, if I say everything I want to say this morning, it's going to be a super long message. Right now, I know you all appreciate that. I do. Yeah. So, uh, what I decided to do, though, for those who maybe don't appreciate it, I have so much stuff that I'm going to divide into two, right? So, you're going you're to get half of this this morning, okay? Uh, about what this battle ready soldiers in the family of faith army is all about, right? So, we're going to talk about the armor of God and the context of that and what that means. And then next week, we're going to get into specifically the di different pieces of the armor. Uh, and talk a little bit more about that and, and how to understand those differently. Okay, so Ephesians chapter 6, first of all, let's read verses 10 through 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. 
Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Well, I believe you can see in this passage, as Paul begins what you could call the beginning of his conclusion to the letter of Ephesians, right? we didn't cover the very end of chapter 6 there, but as he, he says these words to us this morning, he's getting his final message to these Ephesians about what all this means. And I think as we look at this passage, we begin to get the, really what I would call the full picture of what it means when God's great salvation takes a hold of a person's life. It doesn't just save our death, God's salvation, right? We talk about heaven and wanting to get to heaven, and that's a good thing, right? So God's going to save our death, but when we talk about God's great salvation, it's not just about saving our death with the promise of heaven. Because Jesus also saves our life right here, right now. Partly by giving us the Holy Spirit to overcome sin and the flesh in our life now, but then also to enjoy the loving fellowship of the family of faith right now. You see, we're saved in our lives as well. That's what one anothering is about. Our one anothering is a picture of a beautiful gift that we share in. But here's the thing. It doesn't necessarily come automatically or by magic, this idea of one another, without any effort on the part of each brother and sister in the family of faith. It takes our initiative. It takes our input. So when we talk about putting on the full armor of God here, we see the absolute necessity for each of us, notice the emphasis, for each of us in the church to fulfill our personal responsibility. See, the idea is soldiers in God's army don't just hang out in the barracks and then maybe show up at church on Sunday. They must put on God's armor to fight a war each and every day. To fight a war for God's kingdom homeland and for their brothers and sisters and the family. It's an ongoing fight every day of our lives. See, soldiers don't run and hide and make excuses. They take responsibility to stand and fight arm in arm with one another. No deserters, no goofing off. You get it? Yes. Okay. So here's the first thing we're going to talk about in regard to that, okay? The idea of one anothering with personal responsibility. So one anothering is about the group, right? Paul talked a lot about us and ours, the church, and we're together, and we want another, and, you know, it's, that's the group part of it, okay? But in order for that group to be functioning the way it's supposed to be, each person in the group has to take responsibility to make that one other ring happen the way it's supposed to happen. So we have to see the both sides of the coin here, right? One another ring is great when we come together, but each person has to take personal responsibility. The armor here that Paul's talking about is something that has to do with our personal responsibility as we join the army, right? But each soldier has to fight. That's the idea here. See, so the idea of putting on the full armor of God is something that each of us must take responsibility for. Uh, go to chapter 6 here, start at verse 10 again. I think you can see this in the context. It says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. Now, who's he talking to? He's talking to the church as a whole, but he's also talking to each individual in the church. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand. Who's he talking to? Each person. So that you and you and you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Of course, it's in the context of one another. You see that in verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. You see the one another 
but each person is taking their responsibility to stand and to put on the armor. Right? Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. It's a battle. It's a war being raged in the heavens. But we have to see our personal responsibility. You see it there again in verse 13. Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, they might think it's here. <laughs> I think the day of evil is pretty much surrounding us. Oh yeah. I'd say so. So it's here. What are we going to do about it? We're going to put on the armor or goof off, right? So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Again, you, your. You see, there's the personal responsibility of it. Because the one another can't happen unless the army and each soldier is fighting the war. So that you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then. That's what battle-ready soldiers do. They stand firm with personal responsibility to fight for all the saints in the family of faith. You see another example of it down there in verse 18. Paul says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for who? For all the saints. See, we take responsibility to be putting on the armor, to be praying for one another, but it's always for that one another. Right? But we have to be the ones to also take responsibility for that. We also see it back in chapter 4 and verse 16. Right? Again, personal responsibility. From him, the whole body, there's the one another, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, okay, it's one another, It grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. See, the army is not fighting unless each soldier is fighting. If the army is just hanging out in the barracks and playing board games, not going to happen. See, each person, it's one another with personal responsibility. It means that we must actively participate in God's army. It doesn't mean, though, that we use earthly power to do heavenly battle. Because we notice here that it's also God's spirit within us that gives us his heavenly power to defeat the enemy. So I don't want you to get the wrong idea that fighting the war with personal responsibility means you've got to use your own human strength to do it. So the next thing we've got to see is the fact that this personal responsibility has to be coupled with God's power. Right? Our responsibility, and then it's God's power that fills us to fulfill that responsibility. Right? Look again at verse 10. It's pretty obvious. Chapter 6. It says, finally be strong in the Lord. So there's that personal responsibility part. And then, what does it say? Whose power? His. His mighty power. You know how much difference it makes, like your power and your human strength? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> okay? We can't accomplish much against the forces of evil in the heavenly realms with human power. Do we need to take responsibility? Absolutely. To allow God's power to fill us to accomplish something miraculous. Something that only God can do. But he does it through us. You see, it's personal responsibility with God's power. We see that as well back in chapter 3. Right? Start at verse 16. Paul says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit. Power from who? His spirit. His spirit. See, it's God's power. They'll strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, right? So it's the power of Christ in us. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power together with all the saints. Okay, so you see the one another, and you see God's power, and it works through us. So that you may have the power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. 
Now that he was able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine, how can God do something beyond our imagination? Is it by our power or is it by his power? Nosa says in the end of verse 20, he's able to do more than we all ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Okay, you see it? So we want another, but we take responsibility personally to allow God's power to fill us, to change the world. All right, that's what he's trying to get at. All right, so we've got power, right? God's power. So here's a question for you. So who are we fighting with all this power? Take a guess. Who are we fighting with all this power? Are we fighting bad people? No. Huh? No. We're not fighting bad people? No. Okay, so who are we fighting? Satan. Satan. The forces of evil in the spiritual realm. Good answer. You're going to start today, Brother Scott. Okay. <laughs> we use God's power to fight the devil. Okay, so let's talk about that. God's power to fight the devil. What's the second line up there? Say it again. People are not the enemy. Do you think the church gets confused about this sometimes? Yes. You know? All those bad people out there, if they would just stop being bad. Okay? They're not the enemy. They're not the enemy. The devil is the enemy. God loves people, even sinners. Otherwise, we'd all be toast, right? Amen. <laughs> Right? You see, people are not the enemy. Boy, does the church near to hear, need to hear that message. Right? Uh, we got to get that down. Right? People are who we're fighting for when we fight this war in the heavenlies against the devil. The devil is the enemy. People are the people we're fighting for against these spiritual forces of evil. Go back to chapter 6 again. I think it's pretty obvious there, right? Right page. Chapter 6 and verse 11 says, Put on the form of God so that you can take your stand against people's schemes. No, well, it doesn't say that? No. It says, So you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Who's the enemy? Yeah. It's the devil. Duh. Right? It's not people. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Anybody here have flesh and blood? Anybody? Got a little bit of that? <laughs> okay, some have extra flesh. Okay. <laughs> I won't point anybody out. <laughs> I'm losing more all the time. Yeah. <laughs> all right? Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. What about the bad people out there? What about their flesh and blood? Is that the enemy? No. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers. Does that mean politicians? Not in this context. Against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world? That might qualify for some politicians. Okay? But that's not what he's trying to say here. He says, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's the enemy. You see? People are not. We get it? Okay. So now that we know who we are not fighting, we're not fighting people, and we know that we are fighting against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens, the question then becomes is how do we become battle-ready soldiers? Okay? The answer is obvious in this passage. We must put on the full armor of God for these evil days. Now, uh, here's an important truth that you must understand, right? Listen carefully to these words. The full armor of God is put on by allowing the character of God to transform your character and by allowing the spirit of God within you to be lived out by your example of life. Let me say that again. The full armor of God is put on by allowing the character of God to transform your character 
and by allowing the Spirit of God within you to be lived out by your example of life. You see, Paul makes it clear here that God's character and God's Spirit are all about this armor, the armor of truth and righteousness and peace and faith and salvation. It's God's character being formed in us. God's great salvation transforms you to receive God's character by God's Spirit so that your life can be filled with God's power to rescue people from the devil's power and from the forces of evil in the heavens. But of course, we still have personal responsibility, which means that each of us must put on that armor in our character and in the example of our lives. That's how we put on the character. You see, armor is tangible. It's not just words to say. I've heard people discussing this armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6 and say, oh yeah, I see the armor. Okay, God, I'm going to you know, I'm going to put on this uh, belt of truth, and I'm going to put on this bright breastplate of righteousness, and these feet fitted with the gospel of peace, and the shield of faith. Okay, God, like, give me those things. Like, here, put them, put them on there. Okay? And really what it comes down to, those are just words. Is that what God is saying? Well, just say the words, and it happens. Or is what God is really trying to say is, those pieces of armor represent character. God's character formed in you. It's not just words to say. It's a character to grow into and to mature into. It's not just words to say. It's a life to live. 1 Corinthians 4.20, I like this verse. It says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Sometimes it's just too much talking and not enough character, living the life of Jesus. You see, it's battle-ready soldiers who stand strong with God's power to actively fight the war, put on the armor, not just speak words. So Paul talks a lot about our character and our example of life, because Christianity is more than just talk. So let's look at a couple examples of this in the book of Ephesians. Chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, first of all, Paul's going to talk about our character and our life. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Okay? It's not just yakking. Live the life. And then he talks about our character. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Now, if a person just says, oh, I'm going to put on the armor, i got the shield of faith, and i got this, and i got that, but their character doesn't reflect what verse 2 is saying, it's just words. See, it's the character, it's the life that matters. Look at verses 12 through 15 of chapter 4. Paul talks about the leaders there in the verse before, and what are the purposes of leaders? Verse 12 says, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. There's that personal responsibility thing. Until we all reach unity in the faith, there's a one another thing. And in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's our character, our example of life. See, we have to grow up, Paul says. Verse 14 says, Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheme. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. Subscribing our character, our example of life. Chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> Same thing there. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. Not just words. He says, and live a life of love. Live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So what does it mean to live a life of love, to follow the example of Christ? Okay, what did Christ do? He gave himself, self, up. To do what? 
to live his life as a sacrifice for others. You think that might have something to do with how we're supposed to live? Yeah, I think it might. Look also in chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. Paul says, be very careful then how you live. Right? Now, it's important to be careful about how you talk, too. He, other spots in the book of Ephesians, he talked about just what we say. So we need to be careful about our words, but ultimately it's about our character. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. What's the armor of God for? To fight the war in the days of evil. Making the most of every opportunity takes action, not just empty words. Paul talks about empty words in chapter 5 and verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words. I think a lot of, you know, the church world all around, I think there's a lot of empty words. Just religion. Da, 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 da. Don't you just get sick of religion? Somebody say yeah. 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 It's, it's not God's purposes, right? People get deceived with empty words that don't take action. Don't live the life. Don't allow the character of Christ be formed in them to make them mature. Right? So let no one deceive you with empty words, because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. And then I like here in chapter 5, verses 10 through 14, and this is pretty much the last scripture I'm going to re reference here this morning. Uh, chapter 5, verses 10 through 14, I think illustrate an important place of where we need to put ourselves here, right? Because Americans are typically just uh, obsessed with their own pleasures, obsessed with their own comforts, like it's all about me, 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 right? But I like verse 10. It says, find out what pleases the Lord. Wow. When we talk about living life, is it about our pleasures, our comforts, our stuff. How about if we think about it this way? How about if we find out what pleases the Lord? That's a radical idea, isn't it? Maybe that's how we're supposed to live life. Maybe that's what our character is supposed to be. Something that pleases the Lord. He says in verse 11, Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them, except when they're entertaining. You know, because sometimes it's just fun to, you know, play around with the fruitless deeds of darkness and, you know, just just have fun, right? Well, it's not exactly what Paul says. He says it's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is light that makes everything visible. That is why it is said, wake up, O sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. You know, when I think about that statement right there, that Paul says, Wake up, O sleeper. Because from what I can tell from this passage in Ephesians chapter 6 about the armor of God, it seems to me that Christians are supposed to be battle-ready soldiers in a family of faith army. But then there's another option. And I think that's what he's, what I see in Verse 14 there. For the people, the religious talkers in the pajama party club. It's in verse 14. Wake up, O sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine in you. I think a lot of people need to see that. So as Paul goes on in this passage in chapter 6 with the armor, Next week, we're going to learn about what that full armor of God looks like in our character and example of life, specifically with each of the pieces of armor. There's going to be five defensive pieces of armor that we need, each and every one of those in our character and our life, in order to put on the full armor of God. And then we're going to look at offensive armor. We're going to look at the sword of the Spirit and praying in the Spirit to accomplish God's work as warriors. Right? So maybe we can just ask ourselves a question morning, right?
when we talk about this idea of being battle-ready soldiers in our character? Do we feel like we're up to the challenge to be battle-ready soldiers in the family of faith? Yeah. Yes. Okay? Because your other option is to be a pajama party club and just a religious talker. Anybody want to be in that club? No. 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 Nope. No. Good answer. I'm going to stop there for this morning. Is that okay? Did you get enough? No. No? Okay, come back next week. Okay. And we're going to look more at the armor, okay? And then next week we'll be done with the book of Ephesians. Right? Next week we're going to tie it all together, okay? All right, let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you this morning for the word of God and for Paul's description of this full armor of God. Father, we recognize that we are in a battle. It's an epic battle between good and evil, between you, our good father, and the devil. Father, we recognize the fact that people are not the enemy. You created people to live in fellowship with you. And Father, we recognize the fact that we're all born as sinners, separated from fellowship with you, and that we deserve to be punished, to die, and to go to hell. But, Father, because of your great love, you sent your son Jesus to pay our penalty for our sin by dying on the cross. And you proved that you had the power of life over death by resurrecting Jesus from the dead. And now, Father, you call us into this wonderful family of faith where we can find the forgiveness of sins when we give our lives to Christ. And as we give our lives to Christ, Father, and make that commitment, we pray that we would not be guilty of just desiring a pajama party club, but that we would rise up with personal responsibility to put on the full armor of God, to be people of godly character, to be people who have an example of life that reflects the life of Jesus. Father, do that work in our hearts as we endeavor to continue to serve you faithfully. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.